the software and I do it with the computer. Okay, I think we're gonna get started. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a small group, but that's always good with poetry. You have a tight knit group. Um, so just some reminders, um, these weren't out when you came in, but there's Friends of the Arts membership information at the door if you're interested. Um, there's business cards, more information about the kind of programs that Friends of the Arts offers. Um, my name is Christy Hicks. Um, I am originally from St. Louis Park. I live in Minneapolis now, but I'm here often. It's not far. Um, this is where I grew up. I actually have, I was just telling my friend, I have a memory in this building. It's been a while since I've been in here, but the last time I was in here, I was just a little girl, and I have a vague memory of receiving a balloon animal at some community carnival when I was little. Um, that's literally the last time I remember being here. Um, so it's neat to be back in this building in a completely different way. Um, I think these poetry readings, these poetry jams have been going on for several years now. I hosted one a few years back, um, but here I am again, and I'm really excited to see what our poets have to offer. Um, I teach English, so poetry is heavily involved in my life. I also identify as a poet, so it's it's just it's always great to be around other poetic energy. So thank you all for being here and for our readers being willing to share your words or whatever words you happen to be reading, and for our listeners for just being there to soak in the language. Um, and also one more reminder, this mic is just for recording purposes. So as you might be able to tell, there's no amplification. Um, so try to read with your outdoor voice, um, not your playground outdoor voice, but <laughs> just an outdoor voice. Um, yes, and when we were talking about the concept for this poetry jam. Um, it was supposed to be before Valentine's and supposed to have a Valentine's theme, um, but it wasn't able to be scheduled till after Valentine's. But I was talking to Susan from Friends of the Arts and saying, oh, well, we could probably still connect it to Valentine's and love. So the official title is Valentine's, what we learn from love then and now. Um, so kind of a post Valentine's theme. Um, Yes, and just to start off before we get into our readers and the audience, I wanted to share a poem by, not myself, but James Russell Lowell. This is from 1844, so it's a little aged, but um, I always like to kick it back to poetry from, from olden times because it just has this richness to it that we can't, we don't get as much now with poetry, so. Um, I'll read this and then we'll have another reader come up. So This is just simply titled, Love. True love is but a humble, low-born thing, and hath its food served up in earthenware. It is a thing to walk with, hand in hand, through the everydayness of this workday work world bearing its tender feet to every roughness, yet letting not one heartbeat go astray from beauty's laws of plainness and content, a simple fireside thing whose quiet smile can warm earth's poorest hovel to a home, which, when our autumn cometh, as it must, and life in the chill wind shivers, bare and leafless, shall still be blessed with Indian summer youth in bleak November, and with thankful heart, smile on its ample stores of garnered fruit, as full of sunshine to our aged eyes, as when it nursed the blossoms of our spring. Such is true love, which steals into the heart with feet as silent as the lightsome dawn, that kisses smooth the rough brows of the dark, and hath its will through blissful gentleness, not like a rocket which, with savage glare, whirs suddenly up, then bursts and leaves the night painfully quivering on the dazed eyes. A love that gives and takes, 
that seeth faults, now with flaw seeking eyes like needle points, but loving kindly ever looks them down with the o'ercoming faith of meekness, forgiveness, a love that shall be new and fresh each hour, as is the golden mystery of sunset or the sweet coming of the evening star, alike and yet most unlike every day and seeming ever best and fairest now, a love that doth not kneel for what it seeks, but faces truth and beauty as their peer, showing its worthiness of noble thoughts by a clear sense of inward nobleness, a love that in its object findeth not all grace and beauty and enough to sate its thirst of blessing, but in all of good found there, it sees but heaven granted types of good and beauty in the soul of man and traces in the simplest heart that beats a family likeness to its chosen one that claims of it the rights of brotherhood. For love is blind, but with the fleshly eye that so its inner sight may be more clear and outward shows of beauty only so are needed, needful at the first, as is a hand to guide and to uphold an infant's steps. Great spirits need them not. Their earnest look pierces the body's mask of thin disguise, and beauty ever is to them revealed behind the unshapeliest, meanest lump of clay, with arms outstretched and eager face ablaze, yearning to be, but understood and loved. So for our first reader, we'll just go down the list here. Um, if Donna Ronning would please come to the stage and share with us your words. Please welcome Donna. Well, this poem, addresses the complexity of the parent-child relationship. Um, I wrote this poem 10 years ago. The morning my father died, I went home and wrote this poem. So it's called A Daughter's Grief. When I was a child, my dad was bigger than life. Now, on this day, life had become heavier than he could hold. When I was a child, his big wheel and trucks stole him away to numerous cities across these United States. In twilight years, he was bound to one city, one home, under one TV tube spell. Now this unwelcome hospital room was all he didn't know. All these years, I could never predict whether my dad would rub sandpaper or silk over my tender, sweaty palms. In spite of that uncertainty, there was never any question about love. The hint of his kind of love was always lingering in the air you know I love you, could jump out unexpectedly from his lips, his eyes, his smile, his heart, even from his harshness. My dad wanted to give me the world, even though the world had slipped through his fingers. In the next life, my dad is free to use more brain than brawn. In the next life, my dad is free to follow his own advice. In the next life, my dad is free to open his heart. Now that he's gone, I know that in the next life, my dad's free to soar with the eagles. And um, then I'd like to read another poem, just kind of a companion poem. Somebody that also, she wrote a poem about her father after he passed away and there's sort of some parallels to it 
with mine, so I thought it would be nice to read this also. It's called Road Song for My Father by Lydia Howell. She's a local person. I remember my father coming down from his big machine like a man climbing off a horse in another century. Chrome adorned diesel roar, impressive as a 50s hot rod, an urgent fire truck. Another dream he never got paid off. I think of my father, his hands confident on the wheel. He saw the horizon as infinite. I remember my father at his green lit dashboard, an earthbound astronaut hurling towards stars, stars that he never reached on that endless open road. Crisscrossing America, we met as he passed through my city to drop a load. Lottery meetings for truck stop coffee and steak and stories that I searched for clues as to who he might really be. A thousand ordinary things I'll, I'll never know. Rand McNally's atlas will have to serve as his biography. The, end, the interstate, red lines and blue, are all the letters he never wrote. Some say Gideon's horn blows welcome, but I believe it's Diz and Miles and Lewis. Music was our first, most lasting truce, a room that bridged distance. I will remember my father in every big sky at dusk when the sun's gone red. My father's love was like postcards, brief and colorful, unexpected. Something there was not time enough to come to count on. He was a map I'd only begun to learn, torn from my hand, taken suddenly by the capricious wind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Donna, that was beautiful. I love companion poems like that, and it's amazing how many parallels we can draw between two completely different humans, especially maybe they've never even met before. Um, all right. Next on our list, we'll have Michael Amram come to the stage, please, to read your lovely words. Please welcome Michael. Hello, uh, I'm, I'm Mike, Michael Amram. I'm from uh, St. Louis Park. Um, I've been participating in uh, Friends for the Arts events, uh, you know, for a few, uh, few poetry jams now. Um, I'm a poet and a writer. Uh, just had a poem published today. Um, wait, waiting for some books books to be published. Um, and I have uh, some books for sale there. I guess being looked at back there. Um, I'd, li I'd like to begin with a poem. It's about a um, relationship that you know has kind of run its course when when people um, kind of find out too much about the other, and you know they they re regret it. You know, um, and you know ones not willing to, to open up as the other. That doesn't go well. Um, it's called Pandora's Vineyard. I poured my soul out so you'd stomp at it like grapes until your feet felt blue. And you shared some wine, drams of drops lying there. Like leaves, vines, on days when we were simpatico. 
enough to hear the the other when when we're bold bold enough to fear and forsake the other when you'd consent me when you'd consent to teach me to cry your way but I offered my heart tight like a coffin sealed for eternity. I opened it and you laughed. I pried at it and you held my heart and lied. Pandora, I'm sorry I opened up to you. I was bold, your feet were blue, but cold and nimble enough to skip com compatibility. But you prefer your life closed, earthbound, as coffins ought to be. And here, here's a poem. Uh, um, it's uh, it, it's about a, a love that was written. It was someone writing. To, to to some someone the the man thought he was dying and he would leave this to his love. It's called Epitaph. I write this to read one day when doubt has enveloped you like a bloodless alabaster skin. If you read this, my canes have been tipped amply. I've leaned on friends in life with all my weight, comic book heroes. I trusted them to have my back then when souls were born to dance. Conceived to caterwaul past me like phantom friends. They were born to laugh. Heaven sent them here to prattle on endlessly and cross lines you towed. Sup One superficial ticked every minute when the heroes were alive and terrified they, they wouldn't win. So they, so they tried to lie with dignity. Then they danced, they hoofed life hard and hard and met death just right. Life's an undertaker's nap, my love. It's matted it's the matted hair that skirts along the shomer's cap. My dearest one, their voices exceed your rasp. They hide in their they hide in their lips to hear themselves pitch again to resound the night. They dance and sing karaoke past Salvation Army soldiers, wringing hands in prayer that allegories sell. They're heroes who want to get it right where death meets the convenience of an afterlife. So they dance on. They rattle forth, rattling. They amble forth, rattling bells for you. You'll get out someday, my love. You'll sigh and shrug, no expectations for honesty in life until they die. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's fantastic metaphors, um, in the, and especially that first poem. Thank you. Um, I'm always amazed by the depth of poetry from, from different people, which I've already said, but um, I, as a high school teacher, I often read poetry uh, by teenagers who are struggling with things that only teenagers really could struggle with. And even the quietest students, even the um, most 
unassuming students come to me with these incredible poems that just make me cry and make me laugh. And um, I, I just, I just, the thing I love about poetry the most is the ability to open one's soul up in a way that nothing else ever could um, with the simplest but most pointed language. So, um, and it is really vulnerable place to be, even upon this stage, um, showing everyone, even in our small group here, your soul, complete strangers, people you know, people you don't know. Um, yeah. So um, I will read one of my poems um, that is sort of about love, but also just about the changing of the seasons. Um, I mean, to me, every, every poem is about love, honestly. So um, I guess this one is too. Um, but this is about April specifically, which if you know is National Poetry Month, which I try to participate in every year by writing a poem every day. Um, it's worked well, it's been a struggle, but we'll see how it goes this year. But this was written last April, um, and it's just about April as a metaphor, as um, a, a very complicated month. So um, it's called Historically Speaking. <clears throat> Historically speaking, April's extending light, full of itself in bloated newness. The rain, the rain, then the sun, the sun, all this back and forth, the newborn kittens, the blind dogs, the anamnesis when I had wanted to forget, things I worked so hard to forget. But historically speaking, April crawls along. Poems dried up on the sidewalk, left in a beach town where the wind wouldn't let up, dropped like a quarter off a bridge, no sound made on contact. I remember the noise of moving forward, and April is swept. All right. So, thank you. Um, the next reader we have is Bill Meyer. So if you would please come to the stage, share with us your words. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm Bill Meyer. I live in St. Louis Park in an apartment weekdays. Weekends, I go back home to Wausau, Wisconsin. And as my little gadget here opens things up, I was going to read three things that I've written. Two have to do with internet type ish things, and the other is just stupid. Well, actually, they're all stupid, but. So I'm going to re read uh, this one first. It's called Fulfillment Offline. Unbidden emails and unsolicited fervor wave their wands and hoist their hooks, seeking only a simple click that will make my dreams come true. A diet pill to give me the body I want and every woman deserves. An exercise plan and another pill to keep it that way. Shopping opportunities for the proper attractants. Non-surgical skin improvements and if those ministrations are insufficient to win the women, with another click I can find a mate, married or otherwise, for a discreet affair. And a pill to be sure I satisfy. And if that goes awry, another click will take me to a breakthrough in the treatment of herpes and a pill to reduce heartburn, should any of this worry me. They tell me it's so easy to fulfill all my dreams. I need only to look at my wife beside me, offline, to fully agree. This one, this is the really stupid one. Um, it's called <laughs> Flirtation Filtration. And what I did was just every word in this poem is been extracted from the word filtration or flirtation, depending because they're just the same word sideways. So, a fat lion on a trial ration of tart tail, a flare for a fart not far to frail, a frontal talon to lift a nail, a tit for a tat on a titan trail, a liar, a rift in a flat iron fail, 
a train to float on total rail, filtration, flirtation. <laughs> Word games. And then the, whoops, the last one I was going to read is called Internet of Things. Kind of a perm, a perm, a poem that goes in a circle. In the Internet of Things, paranoia rings true. We can rue the rise and our eyes can blur and defer to depression, the oppression of fear that can sear our mind. Or we can find our voice and rejoice in the link as we think of those who rely on us. If our webcams spy on us, may they see only you and me and the love we won't forget in the Internet of Things. Thank you, Bill. There is a huge difference between stupid and silly, which I think those are silly, and I really liked them. So thank you for sharing and making us laugh. So um, those are all our, our readers who signed up. Would anyone else like to read, or would any of the readers who have already read like to come up for another poem? You're more than welcome. Please, Michael, come on up. This is a poem about, um, I, I guess the, the theme tonight is uh, love, um, past, present, or future. Uh, this, this is a relationship. Uh, um, I, I guess the ideal was... Uh, The, the the um antagonist in this poem is an uh, artist and um the protagonist wants to ar arrange a perfect world for her to paint he want he wants to uh br bring nature so it's just right for her her to see um, so it's called the uh, the floating bridge. Your vibes did resonate with me, like smudge windows look out to see. If moons could drip mist for starless skies and and wander silent, asking why pains create views to see sight. You'd predict what was the best course my canvas could take. You'd help me make a perfect world for you, my tender cousin, who'd find her fate if I should find words too late. And plow the fields that find small birds and that mock and sing off key. with brush tails for smaller beaks that peck to nudge you awake, where tails of cats would, would sway to tease the wind. Breezing past marshy lakes, I see the reeds that hide those tails from me. They blow the cattail seeds toward the wind for my relation to sketch the night's moves. Moon's Lover's Show. Thank you. That's very sweet. Um, anyone else want to read? Would you read a couple pages out of this? Sure. <laughs> Okay, yeah. cool. Um, well, I guess I'll read one of your poems by request. <laughs> um, Her Ship's Lullaby. And there's beautiful font in here. I just have to point that out. That's really, to me, going to add to it, I think. Her Ship's Lullaby. 
balanced, skin smacking, sound of flip-flops followed me fast. Down toeless paths, corridors jammed to fill her gaps. For fleet-footed soles and heels, beaten red. I slow, and they pass to follow, her lead toward me. Those angled toes under my door, crack darkened light that disappears. Eventually, I feel waves lift me, tendered from below, setting me down softly as the ship climbs through the night's whiter squalls. Lovely. <laughs> To read, I always really love. I always really love reading other people's poems, um, and when other people read my own, also. So yeah, that was neat. Um, does anyone else want to read? I could read. Sure. Please. Bill Meyer, back to the stage. So back by unpopular demand. <laughs> this is called "Lost Bear Found." Along the swamps of La Crosse, at the base of the embankment where the trains roll by four dozen a day, the shredded remnants of a teddy bear, absent eyes but attentive ears, attests to the passing of passenger trains and of time. It must mean something or have a story to share. A child with a horrified mouth shaped into an O, a jilted lover who tossed the token to the wind, a crutch whose leaner finally learned to let go. But then again, maybe it's just a discarded teddy bear. <laughs> That's the end of that one. <laughs> Fantastic twist. Um, I'll read another one of my poems. Um, yes. This is called Mirror Soul. I can say all the right things, mirror soul. I am not a sage nor a Tao, simply a reflective surface who can probe and smoothly react. When you are sad, it seeps into my being. I wish to take it off your back so you can be strong enough to make us both smile. This never works. Sadness simply duplicates. It's impressively cancerous ways reveling in my silly little thoughts that it could be beat. Every poem I read, I think of you. I wonder what you would say about it. Wonder what we could contort and distort and bring to life and put to bed together. Would anyone else like to read? Come on up, one more time. <laughs> Love, past, present, future. Past, because Valentine's Day is past. Um, the, the, this book was written, like, to, to relate to things. Um, I, I was relating to marriage, you know, not you know, mine specifically, but um, any anyone's. Um, how I, you, you might, um, as as marriage goes on, uh, you know, f find find you can do things yourself. Um, and then and some, sometimes you can't, and you know, everyone needs help, whether they do or not. It's called um, The Fear of Mattress Snags. I could fit our, our mattress cover unassisted. I no longer need my wife, her loving touch, intrude guidance, we're no longer 
required to pull our 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 bed cushions edges tight. I'd slide on the mattress with the tricks I'd learned from the from the head games and the dirty deeds she'd done. She made them clean so I'd allow her flowery pillowcases and duvet slips. Her orange lacy her orange and red lacy satin sheets I'd apply to sleep and try more masculine ones instead. Just to hear her voice moan at night and smooth her coolly so nothing said. She gasps to give her crimson mattress stains whiffs of cigarette breath. She rasps her name in monotones repeatedly intently lulling me to sleep with puffs of smoke rising from her shrunken mouth like eyelets on shoes with their shiny round grommet holes hung for mattress tags that lock-jawed sleepers fear. Her eyes settled, they cut like knives, balanced, shifting, darting askew as her duvet dust dust her bunnies out in the light. So orange sheets amuse crimson in gentle nights. Her hand goes limp like a puppet who's mastered one of the thin strings of that soft mass mattress covers will grow. She stares into death and pre pretends to close her eyes while her lips gurgle final nags, I must know. I pull our cover, cover tight again. Thank you. Well, we are out of readers. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. Um, with a small group, it's always great to to be able to hear multiple poems from from the same people, it just you see so much more depth in people's writing. So, um, like I said, I'm a high school teacher, so the poems that I usually receive when I don't get to read them myself are um, a little intense and sometimes depressing. And you know, I love them; they're beautiful. But sometimes I like to treat myself to a, ch a child's poem, a children's poem. Um, on occasion. So I'll just leave us with the, a short kids poem. Um, maybe you know it. It's called Now We Are Six um, and not overtly about love, but um, I'm sure we can all appreciate the love one can have for um, the incredibleness of a small child. When I was one, I had just begun. When I was two, I was nearly new. When I was three, I was hardly me. When I was four, I was not much more. When I was five, I was just alive. But now I am six. I'm as clever as clever. So I think I'll be six now, forever and ever. So that's the album. All right. Thank you again for coming. Um, please do check out the photo materials back there and consider becoming a member of FOTA. Um, the sign-in sheet was not out when you, most of you came in, so if you wouldn't mind signing in, um, that would be lovely. Otherwise, there's uh, snacks in the back, little cookies and water, um, if you need any water. I've almost drank mine, so <laughs> I need more. Um, but yes, thank you again for coming, and we'll see you at the next photo poetry jam. Thank you. Thank you.